Glory to God. Lord, we'll lift up our hands to you. You are alone worthy to be praised and to be glorified and to be worshipped. There's none like you, none on earth or in heaven or under the earth that has the likeness of our God. And so, Lord, we would just worship you and praise you. We acknowledge you, that you are our Father, and that you saved us by sending Jesus. We acknowledge you, Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah, that you came and died for us, and that you rose again, that we might be justified, sanctified, made holy, made the righteousness of God. And then as you ascended into heaven, you you ask the Father for our sake, and He sent the Holy Spirit. And now, Holy Spirit, we acknowledge You, and we are so thankful that You came and that You are alongside of us, that You bring comfort, direction, that You make future things known to us, that You open the Scriptures to us. And I just thank You that we can have sweet fellowship with You, knowing that it is You who break every yoke. It is You who anoints us to do the works that Christ has done. The same anointing that was on Jesus, you also bring upon us because you're the same Spirit, the Spirit of God. And we just thank you. And we want to yield to you this whole service. We want to give over to you and say, Lord, have your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may take your seats. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Sean. Welcome, anybody else that's new or almost new, half new, you're all welcome. It's good to see your faces. Praise the Yerah, God is so good. I've said last time I will, uh, for the next six months, preach uh, the sermons of, of Dr. Theo Volmerans, but uh, God led me into a time of six hours of prayer from midnight to six o'clock this morning. felt like two hours. And uh, the first hour and a half, I was just fellowshipping. I was just, I wasn't praying, asking, I was talking to God, and, but it was just fellowship, and it was so sweet. And uh, during that time of fellowship, you get to know God, and I'm telling you this to stir up something in your heart. We've been talking about prayer for so long, but God wants us individually to listen to the Holy Spirit that He may take us into a time of prayer. Now, I've asked, asked for, for some of you to, to of all of you to send requests, and I did not receive much, but I prayed over all of those requests as well. And most of the time I spent, I, I, I asked God about this ministry, this church, and so forth, and prayed a lot in tongues. And it was a beautiful, beautiful time of just worshiping the Lord. And... Um, I can tell you, when you pray in tongues a lot, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit begins to stir within you. And we had a nice prayer time here this morning. Uh, I could sense His presence, and God spoke to us even in a song, singing in the Spirit and then interpreting. That's, I, I, don't, I can't remember if I ever experienced that for myself, and it was beautiful. God is on the throne, and God loves you. Amen. And um, as I was praying for my ministry and, and, and just asking God again, He confirmed what He gave me just when I got saved in Jeremiah 1. And um, as I was just meditating on it, He let my eyes jump to chapter 2, and He gave me the message for this morning. And so this will not be one of Pastor Theo's messages. This is something that I believe is born out of the Holy Spirit. Uh, at that very moment in time. But before I get there, I just want to say to you, um, Frank and Mother Lane, don't be concerned about Warren. Warren is, the, is your son's name. And uh, don't be worried about He's He's a little bit wild um, at times. And you tend to worry what would be, become of him. Would he make the right decision? Um, but God says he's had his hand upon him for a long time. And uh, even the things that he has experienced in the past, God has assigned angels. And, and as Satan desired to take his life, God has spared his life. And that was for a purpose. 
Now, he may still have that attributes and that characteristics that you feel is a little bit too much, and uh, maybe he should calm down a little bit and settle a bit more, but God is busy working in his life, okay? I see, it's, is, it, is it his wife or his girlfriend, his fiance? all right? There's depression there, and God's working there. Uh, I see that God's going to clear that thing up. But don't, um, don't rush him. Don't rush them into any further commitment. Um, just pray about it. Pray about it and, and make, make it known to them that you are praying for them for that so that the right decision will be made there. Amen. Amen. Because he's, he's more outgoing. And um, uh, uh, yeah, you hear what I'm saying. And uh, just, just, uh, just bring that before the Lord so that His perfect will be done. But don't worry about Him. God's got Him. God's hand is upon His life. And um, uh, through the training that He has already received and the work that He's doing, God's going to just open up new doors for Him. And uh, uh, promotion is going to come quickly. When it comes, it's going to come quickly after one another. And uh, because He's going to become so engrossed into what God has for Him. And pray for, for him to, to be faithful to the Lord. He knows the Lord. He's heard about the Lord and all of that. But, but he needs to make a total, absolute commitment to the Lord. So just pray. Keep him in prayer. And pray for his well-being and that he makes the right choices. That he stays with the right choices. And that he does not do anything that, anything, uh, that, that will uh, take him out of the will of God. Amen. Charlene, Charlene, she's uh, looking for work. Is it that one? Or is it, is it Charlene? Caitlin, Caitlin. You don't know a Charlene. Okay. All right, Caitlin. She's, w she's the one looking for work. And the other one's Sha Chanel. Chanel is in matric. Okay. All right. But uh, uh, Caitlin, is she studying, you said, as well? She's also studying. Right. I did pray for them last night. And I just really have a peace in my heart about uh, the direction that they are going. Uh, obviously, keep them in prayer. A uh, mother's prayer and a father's prayer has great power. All right? And, um, yeah. And we pray for favor. I believe God's going to give a favor as far as the job is concerned. All right? And... and and the other one, the other one looks for acceptance. And she's going to only get it from the Lord. So you will have to minister to her and show her that the only place where she's going to get that fulfillment is from the Lord. She's seeking, which is good. She's seeking to have that emptiness filled. And that's why she's doing what she's doing. Um, and, and you're a bit concerned about that. But the Lord will bring her in if you pray. And we'll stand with you in prayer. I've prayed for her. And I believe God will do something special in her life. And you'll stand amazed. Now she may be the, the quiet one. But later on, the things will change. And she will surprise the both of you. She'll be a great blessing to the family. Amen. So just know, I've prayed for your children. prayed for you. And God is going to develop you develop you. The two of you together are be, uh, will become a will, will become like pillars in the house which means that you will be strong in the house of the Lord. People will look up to you. God is busy forming you, molding you, getting you part uh, uh, to be part of the life of the church. And so don't think this is just a phase or a season that you are going through. God's going to do much, much. I, in fact, I see that God is has pulled you. It's almost like a hook in your jaw, Mother Lane, for a long time. Even, even as a child, but he, this way, that way, this way, that way, kick against the pricks. And it, was, it wasn't always easy for, uh, for, for the Lord to bring you to a place where you can totally yield to him. But um, just know that God is working in your life and he's doing great things. And uh, Frank, the past is the past. You'll find that uh, less and less you will have any desire when you think about the past to uh, experience those things and to 
even go back and revisit in your mind, God's putting your mind on, in a total new direction. And uh, you're going to grow in your love for the Lord. And you're going to grow strong in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Yera. Praise the Yera. Sean, you're not going to go the way that your family has gone. You're not going to go the way that the family has expected you to go. But you're going to go the way that God has ordained even before you were born. And the reason why you had so much of obstacles and resistance and uh, fell around here and fell around there is because Satan had it in for you because he wants to quieten your voice. And uh, God said he will not be successful. But in these days that you are living in, God's going to loosen you from all of the limitations. And you're going to open up your heart, whereas before you kept your heart a bit close to many things because of the hurt and the rejection and the pain. Now is the time that God's going to just break that yoke off you, and it's going to come suddenly, and God's going to fill you with His Holy Spirit, and you will be changed into another man. And the family will recognize that when it happens, because you will be totally, radically changed, and God's going to use you in a powerful way. Uh, I see a powerful preacher that, that God is raising up. And so um, don't rush. Just stay with the process. But when the Spirit of God moves upon you, I see as the Spirit of God moved upon David at times, then do. Or when the Spirit of God moved upon Samson, then he did something. Or upon King, King Saul, then he did something. So wait for the moving of the Holy Spirit. But I see before all of that, there's going to come a definite time, a definite uh, 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 situation in your life where you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. And uh, you will know it. You will know it because you will be changed. Your heart will be changed. Uh, what you once desired will no longer be uh, part of, of you. God's going to give you a new dream and a new desire. Amen. So just know that the Lord is busy in a powerful way. Amen. Praise the Yera. Praise the Yera. Anna Marie, don't worry about too many things. You are like, was it Mary or Martha that was so concerned about many things? And God says, let go. Some things you just need to let go and sit at the feet of Jesus and enjoy His presence because you've been asking for that. You've been crying, saying, Lord, I miss those days. And, uh, 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 and it's because you've become like, like Mary or Martha. can't remember which. <laughs> was it Martha? And, and Mary chose the best part. You need to make that choice. You need to say, let, let, let the house be dirty if it wants to be dirty. Uh, I'm going to sit with the Lord. I'm going to do what God wants. You know, a house you can clean in a, a few moments or a few hours. Get your house. <laughs> but... Um, to regain that time spent with the Lord. And remember this, time spent with God is never time wasted. It's always time gained. So um, choose, choose the best part and sit at His feet. Amen? Amen. Don't worry about what the, the rest of the family says. You just enjoy the Lord again. God's calling you back to that. Amen. Praise the Yara. Glory to God. Praise you, Jesus. Right, let's get into the message of today. I've entitled it, Backslider Come Back. Backslider Come Back. It's found in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 2. We're going to read verse 2 and 3 first there. Uh, God instructs him just after he called him. And Jeremiah had all these excuses. I'm too young. I cannot speak. And God says, don't say that. Don't. You know what? If there's one thing you must learn as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus and a lover of God, is that don't argue with God. Don't ever argue with God. If God says, I've called you, he said, yes, sir. Uh, where must I go? What must I do? And God wants people like that that will obey him immediately. Uh, he did exactly like Moses did. Moses also said, I can't speak. I sent someone else until God got angry with him. And you don't want God angry at you. You want to be in favor with God. And so God spoke to him, called him. And when he was willing, he said, go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem. 
saying, Thus says the Lord. Now I want you to put in the, uh, in the stead of Jerusalem your own name perhaps. If you feel that you've backslidden, you're not where you are supposed to be with God, God is speaking to you. And this message I know is for us today because it came from the Holy Spirit. Uh, and He knows your heart. I may not know your heart, but He knows your heart. And so, uh, just do this. Put your hand here. Yeah, on the side of your head. Grab. Make as if you grab something. And do this. You pulled the mask off. So, uh, let's just be genuine. And uh, don't put the mask on now. Uh, as you hear this sermon and think it's for her, for him. Just listen to what the Holy Spirit says to you. So put your name in there, in the state of Jerusalem. And he says, saying, thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holiness. And again, instead of Israel, you put yourself Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. All that devour Israel, which is the first fruits. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord God. Now I want you to know that when God looks at you at, or looks at any backslider, he remembers. He remembers, the first thing he remembers there, he says, I remember you. I remember you. There's the Elvis Presley song also like that. I remember you. <laughs> but it's not that one. God remembers you. Now let me tell you. Maybe you have not known this. But God every day is mindful of you. Which means His mind is full of you. You say, how can it be possible there's so many billions of people living on the face of the earth? God is God. Uh, uh, he's, he's so much greater, so much bigger than we can ever understand. And His mind is full of you, and He remembers you. You know, some people have backslidden so far, they, thought, they, they may think to themselves that God has forgotten me. How many of you have ever uttered those words? God has forgotten me. I've heard it from people many a time. But God cannot forget you. God says, I remember you. I remember you. He never forgets his own. He's mindful of you. And in Exodus 2.25, I just want to show you that how mindful of God is of you. You, you know that God called Abraham and, and his uh, seed, his uh, uh, people after him, went into Egypt. And um, uh, they became slaves eventually in Egypt. And uh, they started crying out to God because of the oppression of the pharaohs and God looked upon the children of Israel and this translation says and God acknowledged them another translation says God had respect unto them or God had concern for them or yet another one God knew them so God remembered them and God acknowledge that these people are my people and when God looks at the backslider he looks at you he remembers you and he acknowledges you that you are his and that's so awesome because God cannot forget you he cannot forget how you used to love him how you used to follow him then he says another thing there in that uh, previous verse. He says uh, in Jeremiah now, he says, I remember you, the kindness of your youth. That's the second thing he remembers. He remembers you and he remembers the kindness. Now the youth speaks of your uh, newborn status. When you have been born again, you are like a youth, you are like a young person in God. doesn't matter which age you are, what age you are in the natural. He's talking about after you've, 
you have fallen in love with God. He says, I remember the kindness of your youth. That's the condition you were in after you fell in love with God. The first years, with other words. The first years that you knew God and served Him and followed after Him. The kindness really is affection. It is fondness. I even looked in the Afrikaans. It says, geneentheid. Geneentheid. And, and, and when you look at the meaning for geneentheid, it is to be affectionate. It's to have affection for. And God says, I remember that. I remember that affection that you had towards me. Uh, you couldn't wait to be in His presence. I don't know how many of you can remember when you just came to the Lord. I can. You just wanted to read the Bible. You just wanted to get alone somewhere with God. You just wanted to close your eyes just to feel His presence uh, coming up inside of you. And uh, you would have done everything for Him. His wish was your command. It's almost the same as, as two, uh, a man and a wife, uh, a man and a, and a woman falling in love. That first feelings of being in love and what you would do. I mean, you, you would, uh, if you were a boy, you would bug your father to get the car just to get to her. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And, and it was like that with God when you first fell in love with Him. Now, if you cannot relate to these um, feelings and what he's saying here, if you cannot relate this to God, it might mean that you've never been born again. It might mean that you have been raised in church and have been a Christian, but you've never really fell in love with Jesus. You never really have been born again. Because the Bible says when you're born again, old things have passed away. Everything has become new. Everything. I mean, the bird sounds more beautiful. The sky looks more beautiful. The air smells better. The, everything looks beautiful. And so if, if that is not the case with you, then most probably you have not really fallen in love with the Lord or it has been so long that you've been backsliding that you cannot remember it's to have a tender heart towards the Lord. Remember the tenderness that you had within, a tender heart for the Lord. You would get emotional when you just think of Him. You would get emotional when you try and talk to someone and tell them about Jesus and what He has done for you. And the tears would roll. In worship, you would just cry your eyes out. When you hear a certain song that talks about Jesus and you think oh, of what He has done for you, man, you would get so emotional. That's that tender heart that you had for God. And God says, I remember that. I remember those things. And when you sinned, when you fell into sin and you know that you have grieved the Holy Spirit, man, the godly sorrow that would fill your heart and you would cry crocodile tears and you would, you would come before God and ask Him and beg Him to forgive you and, uh, you know, and uh, the peace that you would experience and the gladness and the joy that you would experience when you have that confirmation in your heart that He has forgiven you. You know, that kind of relationship. It's almost like, you know, you're making up with your partner kind of thing and the joy. You know, that first uh, in love and being in love and according one another, that intense feeling, that intense relationship. God says, I remember that, how you were towards me. And... Uh, the, the peace that you've, you've experienced, so awesome. And then he says the third thing, he says the love when you were betrothed. Now, in Bible days, when you were betrothed, um, what's the Afrikaans word? To be betrothed. Um, kom nou jylle Afrikaanse mense. Verloving. Now, when you were verloof, betrothed, um, engaged is the modern English word. When you were engaged in those days, it was the same as if you were married already. You just didn't sleep together. You waited for the time, but it was like you were married. People saw you as married. And that love, that first love between uh, a, a couple like that, He's talking about that love that we have towards Him. 
or had towards him or that the backslider had towards God. That love of, of that first love. And if you don't believe that God sees you as uh, someone that he is so closely linked to that you can call it a marriage, Jeremiah 3 says that. Jeremiah 3 uh, verse 14 says, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. For I am married to you. Isn't that significant that Jesus also calls the church his bride, that he's coming for his bride? It's, uh, it's, it's that closeness of the relationship. I remember, and I said it many, many times, my first vision where, that I saw in my life was a, a scroll coming down from heaven, written in red in Afrikaans, and it said in the most beautiful handwriting I've ever seen in my life, it said, Ons is een gees en een lichaam. We are one spirit and one body. And I later only discovered it in the word of God that that's actually what the word teaches, that we become so one with him that we are married to him. You know, that's why the, the, the married couple represents Christ and the church because the two become one flesh and one spirit. They actually become one before God and we become one with him in, in a similar way. He says, um, for I am married to you and I will take you, one from a city and two from a family and I will bring you to Zion talking about the coming back of Israel there. And so I just wanted to throw that in to show you how God feels about you and how much He loves you and how He remembers that love that you had for Him at one stage, that you will put Him first, no one else will come first, not your family, nothing will interfere. How many people do you know when they fall in love and they get married, they leave their family behind? It's no longer important to them what their family, their sisters, their brothers think. In most cases, it's like that, especially if they do the wrong thing as well. Then they somehow elope and, and run away because of the love. We're talking now about the love, not that it should be so, but the love. That love that would, that would just do anything for the one that you love. God says, I remember that. I remember that. Now, what is the first, or what did the first love that you had towards God cause you to do? Can you remember? What did that first love that you had for God cause you to do? Hmm? Didn't it want you to tell everybody? You just wanted to tell everybody what God did for you. You wanted to tell everybody about Him. You couldn't wait. You wanted everyone to experience this wonderful feeling of godly love and acceptance and peace that you are experiencing. And so you blabbered your mouth all over the show. People said you were a religious nut and they called you all kinds of things. Yeah, he's a club Christian and all kinds of things because now you all, all you want to talk is God. All you want to do is write, read the Bible. All you want to do is pray. All you, the only places you want to go to is church. You wanted everyone to experience that wonderful feeling. The knowledge that you are totally accepted and loved for who you are. Uh, you had that within you and you wanted everybody to have the same. You even loved your enemies. You were no longer angry with people that you used to be angry with. It was an everlasting love that you experienced and which you responded in total obedience to God. You see, when you love someone, when you love God in particular, you will be obedient to Him. Obedience is then not a hard thing. You will obey. And God was looking and remembering that obedience of Israel. When they realized that God is taking us out of Egypt 
we are now free. We are no longer slaves. And they left with all the gold and silver. They were joyful. I'm not talking about later when they hit hard times, but that first love, that first works, that absolute obedience, when they ate the Passover lamb, and they absolutely obeyed, and they saw how God brought them through the Red Sea, and they even danced in, in worship and in praise, and Miriam still led them with the tambourine, and they sang the new song, and they were so in love with God, and they, they were so awed with God and what He has done for them. And us too, when we first come, came to the Lord, felt like that. We just wanted to sing His praises. We just wanted to be in church. Okay? God says, I remember how you were, your tenderness towards me, your love towards me. Revelation 2 verse 4 and 5 talks about the same thing. Talks about the same thing. He says, Jesus to one church says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Re let's read verse 5. He says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen. God says, I remember you. And I remember all these things. Now he says, remember you therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. First love brings forth first works. You cannot do the first works until you have returned to your first love. So where do you start? Where do you and I start in order to do the first works? We need to go back and remember how it used to be between you and God and what you used to do and begin to do those things. Have you prayed a lot? Have you read the scripture a lot? Have you gone and testified? Have you, begin to do that. Begin by talking and having fellowship with God. Let the communication be restored. Between you and God. Spend time in His presence. I'm guaranteeing you. When you start, you may not feel anything. But as you continue to talk with Him. And fellowship with Him. The more you feel and sense His presence. And there's not a human being that I know. That can resist that presence of God. That would not want that beautiful presence in His life. And the more you, you pray, the more that presence of God pulls you in. And the more hours you find yourself praying. And the more, more hours you find yourself studying the Word. So you have to return back to the love. And you can stir up that love again in your heart. Amen. You can stir up. The Bible says of the husband and wife, husbands, love your wives. Now, many husbands say that they, they've lost of the love, they no longer love their wives, or the wives may say the same thing, but God says, love your wife, it's a command, so what do you do? You stir it up, you remember how it used to be, you begin to do the first things, buy the flowers, do the thing, take her out, and do those first works, and the same with God, God expects of us, God's calling us back into prayer, God's calling us back into intimacy. And you cannot experience intimacy if there is no communication. And so God is asking you and me to come back to that and to do the first works. And first works really has a lot to do with obedience motivated by the love of God. First works is obedience motivated by the love of God. No one needed to tell you to read the Bible or to pray. Wasn't it like that? You just did it because you wanted to do it. Nobody needed to tell you to go to church. Your natural desire was to go to church, to be amongst Christians. Nobody needed to tell you to give your best time to God. You just did that. Amen? I even thought you had to give it a, a, a tithe of your time, and I worked out how much is the tithe of my time. And uh, I just rounded it off to to, to two hours and 40 minutes. And that's what I gave God every day in prayer and in the study of His Word. That's it. Just pray and study of His Word. In my ignorance. And then I would stop. If I only knew I could 
carry on. Sometimes the presence of God was so overwhelming, but now you've, you are in this schedule, this routine. But God wants you to just come to a place where time matters no more. How do you think Enoch walked with God? When you read up on the book of Enoch and, and, and the person of Enoch, you'll find that he, he just walked with God and he would go away for days on end and just spend with God. And then it would be months on end and his family would not know where he was and he would just be with God alone. And eventually he never came back and God took him because he had the testimony that he pleased God. How do you think Moses walked with God the same? Jesus, how did he walk with God? The same thing, always in the presence of God. No desire for the world. No desire for the worldly things. If you have a craving for the worldly things so bad, then it means that your relationship with God is not where it should be. Because you cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. The Bible says whoever wants to be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. And if you crave for what is in this world, what the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, then the love of God is not in you, says the word. And so God wants us to get back to that first love. We need to stir it up. In fact, you wanted to just give everything you could to God. Wasn't it like that? You were willing to lay yourself on the altar. You were, it's like those two missionaries. They so badly wanted to go to a certain country in order to preach the gospel, but there was no way for them. They didn't have money. They had nothing. And so they found a boat full of slaves going to that specific country country and they sold themselves as slaves to get onto that boat as slaves and they went and they preached the gospel that kind of love that would lay yourself down that will give your life for God that's what he wants that's what he looks for that's how many of us felt when we first met the Lord what has become of that and then he says number four he says you followed me you followed me in the wilderness with other words, you would have followed me anywhere because you were so uh, in love with me. You followed me. And you yourself as well. When you first came to the Lord, you were born again. Didn't you feel like it? I will go wherever He sends me. Wherever He leads, I will go. I said that many times to God when I got saved. I will go wherever you send me. And I've gone to places and been to places where I would in the flesh not want to be. But is it still the same? Or is it like some prophet I know that says, I'm built for comfort. I'm not built for the rough places. <laughs> Are you really, really there? Or must you come back to that place? You know, sometimes we speak lightly of following Jesus. Oh, I'm following Jesus. Who do you follow? Oh, Buddha. Oh, shame. I'm following Jesus. And there was a time when everybody had bumper stickers. Jesus on the back. Following Jesus. Follow me, for I follow Jesus. My one brother had a sticker like that, some, something like that on his back. And he was speeding, and at the robot, the guy pulled up next to him, and he says, Ah, I see you. You love Jesus? He says, Yes. You know, very excited. Now he's going to testify. He says, Well, practice what you preach. <laughs> and so we, we need to get back to that love. God is calling us this morning back, calling a backslidden church back to the first love and the first works. Say, so how can I say a church? Because... Well, the Holy Spirit gave this message. And it must be then true. It must be real. John 12, 26. John 12, 26. If anyone serves me, Jesus says, let him follow me. Not follow your stomach or follow your own way or follow your, your, your uh, family member. He says, follow me. I mean, look at this. Look at this. Picture this. Jesus walking on the seashore, seeing Peter and Andrew and James and them 
and say, follow me. And immediately, they dropped everything and followed him. I mean, who would do that? Who do you think in his right mind will do that? But yet, when you meet Jesus and you fall in love with Jesus, you will do that. You will drop everything and you will follow him. He says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. So you always find the man, the woman of God where Jesus is, where the presence of God is. Or if you find a man or a woman that has the presence of God in them and on them, you know that they are where Christ is. Amen. If anyone serves me, him, my Father, will honor. Now just think about this. What does honor mean? It means a lot of things. But think of God, who is the creator of all things, the possessor of all things. If you serve Jesus, the Father honors you. Will you have lack of anything? How would it be like? This thing doesn't stay in my ear. And then he says another thing. He says, Israel, in verse 5, was holiness unto the Lord was holiness unto the Lord in Jeremiah Israel was holiness unto the Lord didn't you want to just be holy didn't you just want to walk with God and get rid of sin didn't you hate sin and hate the habits that so many times came back and bugged you and you were tempted and you cried over it and you fasted over it and you prayed over it because you realize that He has made you holy and, 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 and these things are not to be part of your life anymore. You wanted nothing to do with sin. Instead, you thought the same as the Scripture says. And Peter writes it, I believe. He says, we must even hate the garment that's spoiled or spotted by sin. You instinctively knew by the Holy Spirit what was right and what was wrong. Nobody had to tell you. People immediately did the right thing. I think of Zacchaeus. He immediately, when he met Jesus and, 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 he, and, and he came in contact with the love of Jesus, he immediately said, I will give back everything that I've stolen from people and I will, I will double what I've given uh, uh, to, 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 to those and half of what I have I will give to the poor because instinctively he knew what, what was the right thing to do. Wasn't it like that with you? No one had to tell you what was sin and what was not. You didn't have to ask someone, is this sin or is that sin? You just knew it because you were so given to God. If something just looked like sin, you avoided it. Which is also in the scriptures. That says, avoid all appearance of sin. If something just appear to be sinful, we are to avoid it. And you were like that when you were in love with, with God and with Jesus. You wanted to live a holy life, not to be tainted by the world. You traded your old rock and roll music and your head bashing music and your metal music and your, and your country music for the gospel. For gospel music. Then you just wanted to play gospel all over. Okay? Uh, and if, you, if you were close to me, all you would hear is Jimmy Swaggart singing. Your old hangout places you exchanged for church. You didn't want to go to the discos anymore. Your bad habits, you've replaced them with Bible reading and prayer. And your old friends and family who did not like the new you, they just fell off of you. They didn't want to come near you because now you're a religious nut. Isn't that so? And then he says another thing in Jeremiah 2 verse 3. He says, let's put it up there. Israel was holiness to the Lord. Listen to this. God Summer, when he gave me this message, gave me the tithe and offering message. He says, the first fruits of his increase, first fruits of God's increase, all that devour him will offend. All that devour who? Israel, who is the? 
first fruits. What is devour? It is to eat up. All that eat up Israel, the first fruits, will offend. With other words, you will offend God. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Now I want you to go to Second Chronicles. I want to show you something. Keep in mind, first fruits. He says, and as soon as the command was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithes of everything. Now remember, first fruits, Israel first fruits, the Lord says, if you devour the first fruits, which is Israel, and Israel there is symbolic of the first fruits that you and I bring, the tithes that we bring. And God says, if anyone eats up Israel, devours it, if you and I devour uh, the, the first fruits of our increase, the first uh, portion of our uh, money, our salary, he says what? He says you will offend God. Let's check out uh, Deuteronomy 18 verse 4. 18 verse 4. The first fruits of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the first of the fleece of your sheep you shall give him. It belongs to God. Your tithe belongs to God. And He has included it in your salary or your uh, income so that you can be faithful in worshiping Him with it. Because everything belongs to God anyway. But God requires that you return to Him what is His. And if you should devour it, He says here in, in, uh, in Jeremiah, He says you will offend God. God and I don't know about you but I don't want to offend God I don't want to offend God in anything he says but besides that uh, you will offend God he says disaster will come upon you why would disaster come upon you if you offend God he will not do for you what he has promised in Malachi 10 or 3 verse 10 that he will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so God will not rebuke the enemy. And the enemy will come in and disaster will happen to you. You say, disaster has never happened to me and I have not paid the tithes. Don't mock God. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. Time of reckoning is coming. And so this is a strong word on the tithes, but it comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from, from the message. God has just included it all together. Five o'clock this morning as I was praying, asking about my ministry, God gave me this as a message for today. And uh, if you read the first chapter of Jeremiah, he says, don't be afraid of their faces uh, or when they don't like what you have to say. He says, I will protect you. <laughs> so read, read Jeremiah 1. And uh, he says, you have to speak to all that I send you and whatever I to tell you to say, you must say. Amen? And so there you have it. And uh, we're going to take up the offering and the tithes. And uh, again, I want to say, don't offend God. You don't want to offend God. Amen? Praise the Heer. As we iets here today, and who of die the pastors will read the book? Living Beyond the Possible. Alles klaar met hom, ek wil elke van ons met hom lees. This is something awesome. I'm trying to get more of those books. Um, beautiful, challenging, faith challenging. Amen. Are you ready to take up the offering?
hear me? This is Edwards! What do you want? This is Edwards. I know I ask you this like every week, but would you like to ride to church with me? Oh, come on, Mrs. Edwards, you'll like my church. We have some hot music. It may not be what you're bumping at all, but it's hot. We get down. What do you say, Mrs. Edwards? Oh, I suppose. I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edwards, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. <sighs> okay, here we are. Are you going to persist and invite and <laughs> uh, offer people a lift to church? Amen. Let's pray over the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can have an opportunity to give back to you, return to you what you've given to us. And with this, we worship you. We honor you. And also those who gave via EFT, Lord, we include all of, the, all of them and we pray your blessing upon them according to your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. And as you sit like this, just close your eyes for a moment. If this message at all spoke to you and you know that you are not where you should be with God, I'm not going to call anybody to the front. Uh, I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But if you feel that you are backslidden and you agree with the Holy Spirit and this message that He gave this morning, and you say, that's me, and I, um, I want to make a decision today to do what the Scripture says, to turn back to my first love and to do the first works. I'm not going to find excuses anymore. Or maybe you've never given your life to the Lord and you realize you, you've never really been born again because you've never felt such love towards the Father. You've never experienced such love from Him either. Uh, maybe you've just gone to church and... and you, you, really, you really never had this kind of encounter. If that is either of you, or either way that you feel today, would you just indicate with your hand, and I'll pray a, a corporate prayer for all of us. Thank you for those hands. Be real honest, real honest. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus for everyone who raised their hands. Lord, that you would help them in their efforts to come back to you, to do the first works, to return to their first love. And Lord, I know and you know that there are those sitting here who have not raised their hands. And they should have. And I pray for them too, Father, that you would convict them and help them. That you would remove pride, spiritual pride from their hearts. And that they would be humble before God. And that they will receive, Lord, from you. In the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you will cause this church, with all of its people, to turn back to you. That's what you require from us in these days. And Lord, I thank you that as we do, you will show us your glory. You will show us your favor and your blessing. And we thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. If there's anybody that needs special prayer, you can always come see me. If you're sick in your body, if you need deliverance, if you... 
need a job or there's some issue, some, something wrong, you can always come and we'll pray for you. Amen.